Hey everyone, it's Tim, and today I have with me here a light from one of the newer lights from one of my favorite um, flashlight manufacturing companies called Jetbeam. If you're not familiar with Jetbeam, they've been around for a while, and I fondly recall the RRT0 being, I think, the third or fourth light I picked up ever since I became a flashaholic. I actually sold one, and I reacquired this thanks to former member Kid9P. He sold me a nice mint one with a double A extender and actually a, a Klingon bezel, which I'm not using. But this back then, uh, this is the very first model that had a XRE emitter. And the RRT stands for Rapid Response Tactical, which simply means a rotary ring that gives you access to uh, three or four levels. So I recall this light very fondly because, like I said, it's one of my very first acquisitions after a dairy light. And then this is one of their... Uh, I wouldn't say more recent, but at least, yeah, as compared to the RRT0, uh, one of the more released, which is the evolution of that. And what's really cool about this one is it can produce one of the absolute lowest lows ever seen on a light via its rotary ring. Now, it's very subtle, but right there. If you can see that glow right now, it is on. And you can tell by the reflection, the bluish reflection in the reflector. But it can go super low to, I think, a max, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 lumens. And, of course, it's nicely finished in titanium. Now, they are affiliated with another company called Night Eye. And when one glance at their lights, you can see it's very similar styling and finish as well. Also producing uh, pretty amazing lights. This one's a trio of XML lights. I think pumping out somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2,000 plus lumens. And it was actually preceded by its big brother, the Night Eye i30 which can either run on two or four cells and features a nice uh, carrying handle that is removable but bottom line is like when you look at these lights you know you can tell the style I, i'm particularly fond of it of course that's subjective but i really do like uh, both of their lines of styles and we're going to get on to before we get on to the main star of the show it arrived in this uh, clamshell style plastic packaging which most consumers loathe but fortunately it does uh, open up very easily via these locks here and it's not sealed tight so you don't you know, potentially cut yourself um, using a razor blade or whatnot. So I suppose that's a anti-counterfeit sticker on there with the uh, company's web address there. And just to cover off the features very quick, it can pump out a maximum of 960 lumens, max run time of two hours, and it's waterproof to two meters. That's interesting because it does have a charging port, which I'll cover later. And using what they call a crystal coating technology on the reflectors, it could achieve a uh, throw of 390 meters, which I'll get outdoors to uh, try to test later. I'm assuming that's a little lost in translation because I absolutely have no idea what outdoor forerunner means. So if anyone uh, wants to take a crack at that and leave a comment in my uh, video review, by all means. So within there was a certificate of approval. I guess this past QHX, a warranty card that you can fill out and submit, as well as an instruction manual that has another curious phrase here. It's the rechargeable almighty king. Now again, that's probably lost in translation, and while I can't read Chinese, sadly, I can verify that that last word is uh, Wang. Which, mean, which does mean king, so, but it's just unfortunate I have no idea what that means. But anyways, I digress. Getting back to this, uh, covering off some of the other features here, there are a total of three levels. is high, medium, low. The medium is at 240 lumens, and the low is at 20 lumens. So it is pretty nicely spaced out, but we'll check later in the beam shot section. And last but not least, it did come with a global travel charger. The reason why I say that is because it can run on 100 to 240 volts, 50 or 60 hertz, and it outputs between 3 to 6.5 volts at 350 milliamps. Now the great thing about this is obviously as a cost saving measure, it comes with a replaceable plug. So you, while traveling, I suppose if you can, probably reach out to them and ask for a different country's plug. This, I'm in the US, so it did arrive with the US plug. Now to cover off the rest of the accessories here, you get a wrist strap and two spear o-rings. So diving into the designs and features of the SRA40, this particular light sits as part of their side switch series and obviously that's probably the thing that's going to draw your attention immediately is the fact that there are dual switches. This one is the master on off switch and this is a mode switch. With the master on off in the off state, the mode switch acts as a battery level indicator. So a quick depress of the button those two lights indicate that the batteries are at full power. If it was one light, then it would indicate 50%, and if it's twinkling as per the manual, which I think actually means blinking, it means that you need to replace the batteries. 
I'll get into that more in the UI section, but at the very tip of the light is a bezel that it looks like it could be removed but for this particular sample that I have it uh, seems to be glued down I couldn't get it to come off now for my videos for wh those who are not too familiar when I say that a bezel can be removed I don't necessarily mean that the light can be used in that way in which case I will mention that it's more about being able to access the reflector as well as the especially the LED for those who are so inclined to mod the light. So that's the context behind that. Now the this glass, the lens is made from ultra clear mineral glass and as you can see this got that nice AR coating. It is double sided coated. And within there you can see the ultra smooth reflector which they claim has a crystal coating technology that enables us to cast a beam out to 390 meters. I'll get this outdoor to test the beam throw later but for now here's a close up of the XML2 emitter. Just half of the bezels are these uh, grooves that serves for heat sinking purposes and while not very deep, one needs to keep in mind that there is substantial mass in the head. By way of comparison, here is the Sunway Man D40A and as you can see, the SRA40 is a bigger light with uh, definitely more mass overall, even though those heat fins are not as deep as on the D40A, but likely, you know, the overall mass will help the heat dissipation. And as you can see, it does feature a larger diameter. The inner diameter here I measure at about one and a half inches, and this one's about just a little over one and a quarter. The tube of light does feature this nice rhombic texturing, however, it is fairly smooth and doesn't really offer much in the way of a grip. However though, I feel that with the flare here at the end of the base of the head, as well as a potential small flare here at the base of the tube, you kind of have, you know, a okay grip uh, without feeling too loose. However, one needs to keep in mind that I have medium sized hands, so this is already sitting towards like the middle of my palm here. Um, so for those with particularly large hands, I think I'm guessing it probably may sit closer to here with your thumb on the switch. So something to keep in mind if you're considering the purchase of this light. There are a total of four flat sides on the tube. So the main side that faces the same direction as the switch features the company name, their web address as well as the model number and on either end, the left or the right, I presume, um, it's left blank and towards the back there is a warning symbol that about using high quality uh, nickel metal high drive rechargeable cells with the same brand and same capacity. Now the reason for that, which I'll get into more later, is because uh, the cells are wired in series. Now on the bottom of the light is this X design motif which is purely for aesthetic purposes and here you can see the charging port which doesn't feature a cover whatsoever. Now keep in mind that the company has claimed a IPX rating of up to 2 meters. I, do, I can't test to that depth but again I'll throw this into the tub or sink later just to see if there's any water ingress. The head and the tube is milled as a single solid piece. There is no gap there so you can't untwist the head off. The only way that you can actually access the batteries is purely through the tail cap. Here you can see the inner part of the tail cap which features um, two springs for the two negative um, batteries and as well as uh, two poles for the positive tip. Now this thing is free spinning so what you do is you need to align these two tabs that stick out here at either end with the corresponding hose there in order to get this tail cap on. It's not exactly the easiest thing to do because and I, I found it interesting that they actually highlighted the fact that you know in order to install this in the dark you could use those tabs but I'm actually already having a um, slightly difficult time even in uh, broad daylight so something else to consider. This differs from the Sunway Man D40A and that the D40A had a carrier. Now I can't say I really prefer one over the other, however in my personal opinion I think with the cell carrier you're just a bit more mindful because you're looking at the cell carrier and you're actually inserting the cells where this you're kind of slotting it in and you know pretty much one would take a quick glance look at it says okay that's a positive pole put the positive in this side but it's very easy to slot it into the wrong one. Um, this does have reverse battery protection however my concern is that Regardless of if you insert these cells all in the wrong polarity, the fact that if you're mixing and matching, so let's just say I do something like that, um, these cells will connect together because they are all wired in series. So one just has to be a bit more mindful about the polarity of the batteries when inserting them. On the plus side, there is ample room in there. So these are PowerX uh, 2700s. They're my widest, largest diameter batteries. So there is more than enough room to accommodate four of these without any issues.
Now, if one particular note, and I don't know if this is a bug on my particular sample or it's the same way across all of the SRA40s, is the fact that as soon as the light receives power, regardless of that you lift, you've left the light off and there is memory mode, this light will turn on. So as you just saw, and I'm not even fully threaded all the way through yet to the very end. I really wish the SRA40 would stay in the off mode as soon as the light receives battery power, especially in consideration that, again, this does have memory mode. So if you last memorize max output, you don't want to be in the dark changing battery and all of a sudden you screwed it in, bam, it comes off in full power. Now at the base of the light, this tail cap does feature three prongs, each with its own attachment point for either a lanyard or the included wrist strap. And this also is, I believe, a tripod mount, but the strange thing about this is, you know, not just the peculiar placement, because you figure the only way you'll ever be able to use this meaningfully, at least directionally, is if you had one of these Gobi. But even so, uh, mounted this way, you would have to aim it in a particular way, and all that weight would cause it to topple forward. So just thought it was a pretty strange location. Of course, it probably would have been better if it was like over here, so you have better control on a standard tripod without worrying about tipping over or balance issues. So just to cover off quickly on the charging aspects of this light, there is that uh, LED on this wall wart, and when you plug it in and you turn it on to start charging, that LED does come on. Also, as you notice, the two LEDs here will start blinking and alternating to indicate that it is charging. When the light is fully charged, it will remain lit. Now yesterday during charging, I did notice that I put in recently charged cells. I believe they were all at about 1.39 volts. And by the time I checked, the light was actually a little bit warm. So I figured, huh, let me check on the voltage. Took them out, checked it on the multimeter, and it was around 1.46 volts. So I'm not really sure what algorithm this uses yet, but I'll get to that when I do a charger deep dive of the light. Wait, I feel my ESP kicking in. So I guess you're rationalizing. Hmm, tripod adapter, charging adapter. Can the light be used with the uh, just the adapter and no batteries? That answer would be no, because as soon as you uh, give the charger power, the light will shut off. And for those stubborn diehards um, who still don't believe me, here it is. All the batteries are out, simulating just the power adapter. As you can see, that's on. This light will not turn on. Sorry, guys. Size-wise, since I don't have any other four AA lights to compare with except the Sunway Man D4A, um, which I actually compared earlier, so as you can see, overall it's a little bit bigger. It's a larger diameter head, as well as just having a overall slightly longer length. And in terms of other multi-cell lights, this is the TM26, which runs on four 18650s. Speaking of which, um, here's a ready last 3400 by comparison. It's 18650 size battery. And then a rechargeable AA, the Tenergy. Although it's not the smallest, it's not terribly large either. In terms of ergonomics, obviously this will be different for everyone, depending on the size of your hand. Again, I have medium-sized hands, and this feels fine, although it doesn't feel like it's the most secure grip. So it's, again, this rhombic texturing here is not exactly aggressive. It's fairly smooth, but that groove coupled with this flat little surface here that one can rest uh, one's index finger on couples to create a decent grip, presumably with your thumb on the mode button, so that way in case you want to operate the light to change the modes while you're handling it, it's actually okay. It's not too bad, but again, I just feel like if you had larger hands, it might be an issue because this is a little bit on the smaller side. It is a compact light after all. And for use with gloves, this is a standard winter glove. It's not form-fitting. The reason why is I wanted to see how this would operate with, you know, if your hands are kind of like, you know, you can't really feel the buttons. So the thing is that the mode button is a little bit more raised than the power button. So at least when you're operating it, you do kind of are able to feel, differentiate that through the glove. The mode button is definitely more prominent. So once you've got the light on, you should still be able to operate this without any issues. So touching upon the fit and finish, one glance at this light and you'll instantly know it's a jet beam. If you've ever handled one, you'll know exactly what I mean. It's Their finish has always had this particular sheen to it. It's almost got like a charcoal finish. And this coloration that you see in the video, at least what I'm seeing on, on the LCD screen, is fairly representative of what I'm seeing in real life. Perhaps it's not as greenish as you see here. It literally is almost like a pencil lead 
type of color. Now one thing of point is that this bezel is a slightly darker than the rest of the body and the tail cap does also seem perhaps a little bit shade off but overall again the finish is just outstanding. The anodization there's none missing between the crevices or the edges or whatnot. It just is a very very nice finish. Now the laser engraving is all done very nice and sharp with no blotchiness whatsoever regardless of the model name or even this little warning sign here as well as the hot symbol and the serial number at the tip of the bezel. The build of the light, it just feels like a tank because again, this is a single solid integrated piece here and there is a decent amount of mass here. So again, by comparison, it is definitely a bulkier light than the D4EA. So it, I mean, they're very similar lights. They both run on four double A's, but I've had to make kind of like a comparison. This is almost like uh, Nissan's Pathfinder to their uh, JX, Infinity JX, or I believe it's now QX series. So they're actually based off the same car, but yet they're different. As I had highlighted in my D4DA review, I guess this particular implementation of the buttons, I wasn't too sure, you know, how it would hold up because this is more of a plastic film versus this. This is more of your standard rubber buttons with a very nice brushed uh, finish. I don't know if that's uh, aluminum or stainless steel. I'll check that out later. And that plate is held together by these six star-shaped bolts. In terms of the button operation, I guess because there is just a minutia of uh, play there, it kind of feels um, a little spongy, but again, I'm, I'm being very nitpicky here. However, though, the electronic switch underneath it does provide a nice tactile feedback, uh, likewise for the Mo button. The Mo button in particular suffers from that. As you can see, you probably see that little play there when I push in my fingernail into it. But again, they do both provide very nice, solid, you know, tactile feedback. While these threads are not square cut, they are silky smooth because of the anodization. They did come amply greased, so I didn't feel much in the way of grittiness. And as you could just hear, just silky smooth. I suppose if there is any one particular concern, it remains this charging port. Again, I haven't been able to test it yet, but I will get to that and put it in, into either my comments or as well as my written review. So while this particular sample is sponsored, and of course I'm sure there are a few uh, Jaden members out there uh, in my audience watching this video, I have personally purchased a few of their lights and I've never been failed to impress by any of their quality. I do recall though, in the very earliest batch of uh, the Jetbeam RT0, there were problems with, you know, I think, either overheating or just, just flickering on the RT0, but that was many lights ago. I, I actually haven't um, had any problems with the other lights since then, a TCR1, TCR2, RT1, uh, M1X. So again, just fantastic, solidly built lights. The UI operation of this light is very straightforward. So again, there is a master on off switch. And with that in the off state, the MO switch actually functions as a battery indicator. So a quick presser, as you can see, those two lights come on. The two both on means your parries are full. If it's just one, it means about 50%. And if it's uh, blinking, it actually means you need to replace the battery. So now there is a memory mode. The light will always come on in the last memorized state. So right now I currently have this on low, high, medium, low. It always cycles in that way from the brightest to the lowest. So once it gets past low, it cycles back up again high with an output of 960 lumens, medium with output of 240 lumens, and then finally low at 20 lumens. The exposure is fixed, so this is a real life representation of the differences in the output. Now to access the secondary modes with the light on, if you depress and hold the power button, it will immediately enter strobe. And to exit out of that, you can hit the mode button and it'll default back to your last memorized state. Or, if you were in the strobe and you hit the power button, it'll shut off the light. It will not memorize the strobe mode. It'll always default back to a output level. Now with the light off, you could also access the strobe after a brief delay by pressing and holding the power button. It is a fixed rate strobe. I don't know the hertz, but as you can see, it does not cycle to uh, different speeds. There is also a SOS mode that can be accessed via the mode button with the light on by depressing and holding that mode button.
And to exit out of that, you simply press the Mode button. Now one thing I didn't really cover off before, but you may have noticed, is the fact that as it changes output level, it's not erupt. It actually kind of dims down, as well as fades down, fades up. So if you notice, perhaps this might be a little bit better. So that's off, on, and as I change modes, you see that? It does kind of like a little fade down. So by comparison, here's Sunway Man's D40A. As it changes output level, as you can see, it's fairly immediate. It does have a very, very slight fade, but nothing quite like on the SRA40. In the end, some may find that to be a novelty, but for me personally, in pitch black darkness, with that very brief transition, I find that to just be easier than eyes than abrupt level changes, even though however brief it may be. All right, for the beam profile, this time I've decided to do something a little bit different. So for those of you who have been following my reviews for a while, you'll probably be quite familiar with this scene. It's my um, upstairs hallway where I'm setting up right now the camera, uh, Sony RX100. It's about five meters from that, um, my light meter. So I actually have a D600 down on the floor that is filming the light meter since you can't actually see the values from this distance. So I will incorporate that into the bottom right corner of the video. But for now, I'm actually using a Xeno G10 V2 to eliminate the scene. As you probably know from following my reviews that this is one of my standard lights that I like to use because it's perfectly regulated. And at this distance, it's um, casting a beam of uh, 234 lux uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, translates roughly into a um, 150 meter beam distance, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So the shutter will be locked and, the, sorry, the exposure will be locked at 150th second, aperture at 1.8, and the ISO at 400. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to move this beam up, again, because the Nikon D600 is recording the um, the reading, Lux reading, and then that way you could get the full values as I do that. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to star of the show. This is the Jetbeam SRA40. So shut off my headlamp. So I'm going to start this off on the lowest setting. So might as well just capture all the readings. Now the D600s um, is on auto ISO, so that way you know it can respond to the changing uh, light. So okay, that's on max, and I get a beam throw of about 1,200 or so. Well, let's let it settle first. And it's also, let's try to get the max. So, as you can see, at five meters, you know, a slight little change in the beam will not really throw off the reading too badly. You're still within, like, you know, single digit range. Whereas previously, when I used to measure at one meter, it used to change drastically. So, that wasn't exactly um, a, a great uh, way to go about measuring it. However, though, now with this, okay, it looks like it's stabilized around there. So, getting a reading of about uh, 1160, 70-ish depending on, again, how I hold that beam. And I was actually expecting, in order to match the 38,000 candela uh, for the 390 meter throw, I was expecting a lux reading of 1,521 lux at this distance. So in general, this it's been an excellent light meter, x -tech, fairly accurate, uh, especially as far as my PVC LMD is concerned. But I've noticed that in terms of lux reading, it's tend to be a little bit low, but still, it, it shouldn't be that off. So Take it with a grain of salt. It could be that my meter's reading low. It could be that, uh, again, not quite hitting uh, manufacturer readings. Plus, not to mention though, this is actually probably advantageous my setup because you've got the white wall closet here and there, and there's gotta be some reflection coming off there to help boost the reading here. So if anything, like I said, this setup should actually favor a uptick in reading. Whereas again, I'm not quite getting to that 1500 mark as you can see here, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and get that beam profile up to the very edge until it's gone and then back down. All 
So again, this is to give you a rough idea of the beam. So I'm going to actually hold it up here slightly for a while. So you can see, um, step this down. In the center there, there's actually a very, very, very mild uh, donut hole. Not sure if that's quite coming out. Oh, there goes the step down. So after roughly three minutes, it steps down to about 760 lumens or so. But again, this should give you a fairly good idea of the beam. But more importantly, the main point of this exercise was to get the um, the lux. So now I'm also going to throw in the Sunway Man's D48. So this is actually on the lowest setting right now. And this one, I think Sunway Man had quoted 24.8K uh, candela, equating to a 315 meter throw. So let's go ahead and just pump this out to max. Okay, I'm confirming max. We'll just let that settle down for a while. Now the Sunway E48 does have a smaller reflector, plus not to mention it's very uh, light orange peel. So I definitely don't expect it to be on par with the SRA40. Again, just even evidenced by the uh, manufacturer rating. So the, I was expecting in order to hit 24.8 candela, I'm expecting a Lux reading of 992. So basically, in case you didn't re realize, it's the inverse square law. So at five meters, I'm basically looking at um, the Lux reading times 25, or if you know the candela, the candela reading divided by 25. So in this case, let us set it down for a bit. Again, I was expecting 992 lux, and I'm actually fairly near there. So as you can see, um, on the light meter there, it's ranging around 930, 940-ish. So not too far off from what some women quoted. And again, keeping in mind that, yes, these walls on either side boosts the reading slightly, but also the fact that my light meter tends to read a little bit lower for um, throw as compared to you know other reviewers so far. Okay, let me just move this, same thing. Okay, that's the edge of the beam so that at least no, um, in my opinion, from what I can see here, no part of the spill is actually hitting directly on the Lux reading on the light meter sensor, and then back on again. So the D48, like the SRA40, will also step down after approximately three minutes. And let me get the beam up here. Step it down so you can kind of see the beam profile. This is at one five hundredth of a second now. And back up. Now, given this is the first time I'm doing this, um, obviously, you know, it, this should improve in future reviews. But uh, again, this was to give you a rough idea of the um, lux, the throw readings for these lights. Now, next up, I'm actually going to throw in um, Shadow's uh, JM26. This has about 800 lumens output and according to Shadow, a um, 36K candela reading, but at one meter. So at one meter, it equates to candela. They actually measure at 36K lux but at one meter they're equivalent. So we give this uh, 30 seconds to settle down. And in order to hit that 36K, I'm expecting a Lux reading of about 1440. And look at that. This guy's actually an overachiever. This is actually hitting about 1700 Lux, as you can see there. I mean, that's um, probably closer right there. There we go, 1800. I don't exactly have the most steadiest hands, but in this case, then, we're 1800 times 25, can't do the math off the top of my head, but that's easily over 400 meters. So, and plus also, if you take into consideration that uh, my light meter tends to err on the side of uh, lower, it's potentially more. So let me get this... Um, Beam out of the way. Screw up to the top to reaches the edge, and then back down. 
GM26, due to its, um, you know, of course, it has a much larger reflector. Uh, not necessarily as deep, but, you know, for its size, that is. But, again, as you can see here, even well after 30 seconds, it's still easily resting around 1800 lux, uh, depending on which portion of the beam it's reading. So, again, not perfect, but at least this gives you a rough idea of at least if the manufacturer's readings are within the ballpark. In terms of the beam angle, the overall spill is at roughly 72 degrees. And the hot spot is roughly 20 degrees. As an initial conclusion, I feel like this is a very solid release that eschewed any fancy UIs or um, even anything particularly that really stands out. The recharging is not nothing terribly new. There is no special UI that like say, you know, there's various thousands of hidden modes or whatnot. It's a simple operation. You got your on off here, three modes plus two hidden modes that could ac be accessed very easily through this combination of switches. Pretty much anyone should be able to operate this light. It is extremely rugged. I just have all the confidence in this world it could stand up to some fair amount of abuse. And it's a light that I would wholeheartedly and safely recommend to pretty much anyone for use. I guess the thing that is still outstanding, which I'll get to later when I do a charging deep dive, is, is the algorithm of the charger. I guess I would like to understand when it terminates and whether or not it's safe for the cells. But overall, as mentioned, it's a fairly safe to use light. Something you could probably recommend to family and friends um, with a level of comfort since it could take standard alkalines as well as nickel metal hydrides. You cannot use lithium ion cells with this light. The voltage would be way out of bounds for it. But again, it's fairly safe that you can use alkalines, nickel metal hydrides. However, I'm not sure about lithium cells since I don't have any on hand at the moment. But when I get some, I will update my written review as well as my comments here in the future. The three things that I could think of that I wish was a little bit different on this light is one that this was a standard tripod mount and that it was actually probably located here instead of at the end of the light uh, for balancing purposes. Secondly, I wish that the light would not engage when as you change the batteries and you're engaging the tail cap, thus it turns on immediately. And last but not least, I wish they had a holster for this light because I feel like it's a great light to carry around. Not exactly EDC size, but not too much mass to be sticking out of your belt either. Bottom line, I feel this is a fantastic light. It's got really good build quality, and plus not to mention it's very robust. Takes standard cells and rechargeables as well. Has the capability to be recharged as well. And also the fact that it's waterproof to six meters despite that. Um, bottom line, I feel this is a fantastic light. It's got really good build quality and it's extremely robust. I have all the confidence in the world again that this will take some fair amount of abuse. These uh, buttons are fairly solid and overall again, I like the fact that it takes common cells as well as the rechargeable cells so you could safely recommend this to friends and family. So great job Jetbeam! As part of FTC disclosures, the Jetbeam SRA40 was provided by GoingGear.com for review courtesy of Jetbeam. Thanks again for watching.